So today, uh, I want to start the summer sermon series. And to introduce this series, I'm going to show you a picture uh, of some pies. I'm 100% certain this is like breaking public speaking rule number one or something. Uh, <laughs> we got a half hour yet of me talking, and there's a bunch of delicious pies. So sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> I don't know what you guys like better. I, I could eat all three of those. So for future reference, uh, I like, I'm just, I'm just saying, I like pies. Um, sorry to say at this point that this series really does not have to do with eating pie, although if you get very technical, and I notice how some of your brains work, you'll think this through, and you'll realize by the time you're on your way home or something, I, I see how that works now, uh, it could apply to the very eating of pies. Um, however, uh, what it does have to do with is not pies, but pie charts, pie charts, and there's a few of you out there I know right now thinking, oh, here he goes again with this math stuff. Um, as a previous math teacher, if you didn't know, I, was, I used to be a math teacher. But uh, a few of the Reese girls a couple weeks ago uh, found me after a sermon and they said, I really like when you put math in the sermons. And so I apologize to all the rest of you who hate that. They asked for it, so here I go. Um, so pie charts. Uh, here's a pie chart. And... It has the sort of things that we do in our lives, or I want you to think about or picture the sort of things that you do in your life break, broken down as something like a pie chart. And so you might say, uh, a big part of my life is my family, and so that gets you know, some section of your personal pie chart. Maybe you have work, that's a big section. Uh, for all of us, uh, at some level, I think, uh, sleep, you might not think about this, but sleep takes up a good bit of your time, something like that. Technology, if you follow any teenagers, or any adult for these days for that matter, technology, that's a big piece of your pie, and so on and so forth. So you could see that you could, you, one way to think about your life is to think about your life as kind of filled up by all these different slots in our pie chart. And I think that um, a lot of us then might have a piece of our pie that's devoted to God, or a relationship with God. And so uh, that might for you look like, you know, I spend some amount of time kind of in prayer and Bible study every morning. Uh, for everybody here, you have some part of your pie chart that's related to God because you're here on a Sunday. Um, or whatever else, whatever other spiritual things you do in your life, you might say, well, that fits into this pie chart uh, section, this piece that's re my relationship with God. Um, maybe because of that, you feel like uh, oftentimes the issue is that that piece of your pie is smaller than it ought to be. And so maybe uh, if that takes up, say, 1% of your time, you think, I need to grow in that area, and I need to maybe see if it takes up 5% of my time. Or if it's already at 5%, maybe you say it needs to take up 10% of your time. Or if it's 10, you 20. And you can see this idea where I think, and I could be wrong about this, but I think that a lot of Christian folks say something like, I need to give more time to God, but there's also all these other pieces of our pie chart, and so it's like, how, do we, how can we fit that in? How's that going to work, right? And that can lead to some level of guilt, which says, you know, I, I don't know how I could spend 100% of my time with God. Like, how, how's that going to work? And you feel some level of guilt because of this. Um, I see people nodding, so I think some of us feel like we just aren't doing enough for God or some, something to that effect. Um, I'm here, hopefully, today <laughs> to try to help that precise, that particular issue. I want to help that particular issue. Now, what I'm not going to say is that we don't need to spend time with God or that we don't need to stop and read our Bibles in the morning or something like that. But I want to, I want to present a different way in this summer sermon series for us to think about the pie chart of our life. I want, to, I want to share a different way to think about it entirely. And that is as simple as this. Um, I think we just can solve that whole issue by putting God and our relationship with God into all the different pieces of our pie chart. In other words, instead of saying, I need to do less of these non-Christian kind of things, and I need to spend more time with God, a solution to that that you might not think through is, let's just put God into all the things that I'm already doing in my life. And all of a sudden, we find that 100%, and this is the title of this series, 100% of our life can involve or relate to our relationship with God, and we don't have to have the guilt or the whatever that we're not spending enough kind of Christian time. 
Here's another way to think about this whole thing. A lot of us, uh, whether we think through this or not, I'm pretty sure, have this view that we do some parts of our life that are like the secular things. These are like the things that we do in our regular life. And then we have this other part of our life, which is the Christian things that we do, or the spiritual things that we do, or the relationship with God things that we do. And instead of saying, let's just increase this part, and we don't know what to do with this stuff over here, why don't we just say the whole thing, everything is actually connected with our relationship with God. Um, Here's a a third way to think this through. And I'm really trying to drive this home because I want us to have a a good foundation before we head into this sermon series this summer. Christians uh, ought to believe that Jesus is Savior and Lord. Jesus is Savior and he's Lord. I think practically speaking, what a lot of us do is we say Jesus is Savior and I'm going to kind of want him to help me when I die so I can go to the good place. And yet we are not willing to give him up as allow him to be Lord over all the rest of the areas of our life even now. And what's ironic about that is that we miss out on good experiences of all the rest of those areas because we didn't allow him to be Lord of what we think of as our secular or our non-spiritual kind of life. Okay, so here's what this is going to look like. Um, In uh, this sermon series, each of about 10 weeks or so, I'm going to pick a particular area of your life, and I'm going to talk about how God or your relationship with God can influence that particular area. So, for example, next week is July 4th, and I'm going to talk on a day where most of us would have off work, except for me, because I'll be preaching. Um, I'm going to talk about work. And so I want to talk, I want us to think through, because so many hours of your life are spent working, I want to think through what's the spiritual or the Christian view that we can use to think about this idea of work. (laughs) The week after that, I'm going to do a sermon on sleep. And you're probably thinking, I have no idea how he's going to do that. Well, come in, whatever that is, two weeks, and listen to me talk about how God affects your sleep. And I think it does. I'm also going to work on a sermon. And if if you know any teenagers, I'm going to have a sermon on cell phones. I've been thinking about this for quite a while now, like months. And I want to preach to to talk to all of us to say, what do we do with these devices and what and our relationship with Jesus, how do those things interact at all? Because I know a lot of us have those things, and they're forming us, whether you like it or not. So um, we'll talk about that in a few weeks. I have a sermon on sadness uh, planned. Uh, There we go. I have a sermon on marriage. I have a sermon on um, parenting, and a couple others uh, that are also in the works. So the idea is going to be to talk about how does our relation with God impact those areas of our pie chart, So we can see that 100% of our life is in our spiritual relationship with God and not here's God and here's my real actual life. Okay, for our purposes today, I want to do a for example of this exact kind of thing. And since uh, a bunch of us are going to go to the uh, All Miller camp for the picnic afterwards, uh, I've chosen an area to talk about that God impacts our life that you probably don't even see as a piece of your pie chart. My guess is that although every single person in here has already experienced this today, you may not even see this as like something that's involved in your real life. Maybe from the songs you have a sense of what it is that I'm going to talk about, Um, but it's this. It's our relationship with nature, our relationship with God's creation. So uh, if you're physically here today, I assume that everybody uh, at some point, unless you have a garage and then have like a secret portal into church, every single person here was outside at some point already today. And you'll probably be outside even more today. Even for those who may be watching online or are stuck at home, this kind of thing, you at least have a window. And so all of us in every single day of our lives have some connection with the natural world. And what I want to do today is I want to think about that as like a room that is, uh, can, can, be, can be dark and can have the lights off, but in a relationship with Jesus, what happens is those lights can be turned on and that we can have a fuller expression, a fuller experience of our relationship with nature. Now, um, I was tempted to make a list. So I started creating a list and it pretty, lo- uh, pretty quickly got to involve a lot of names. A list of the people that I know from here at church who love uh, nature for some way, shape, or form. And 
If y'all have heard me talk, you know I'm one of those people. But um, whether it is those of you who might like hunting and fishing, and so you like to be out in nature for that kind of thing, whether it is our mountain bikers in the crowd uh, who like to be out mountain biking, whether it is our gardeners who show us you know, wonderful pictures of the gardens, this kind of stuff, um, whether it is those of you who just like to go for a walk every afternoon, lots of people here at Kish, I know this for sure, lots of you like to be outside, right? Okay. What I'm saying today is that you can experience that, you can be outside, and yet you cannot do it as connected to your relationship to God. Right? It's possible, and you, you can imagine this. You can imagine kind of like uh, some super environmental folks who are saying, we love nature, we want to be in nature, but they have no concern or care whatsoever about Jesus. And so it's exactly those kinds of people that unhelpfully uh, experience this relationship without God. That's what I want to get at today. Okay. Um, anybody here go or going to the beach this summer, if, you, if you've gone or, or are going to the beach this summer, a lot of people experience, when you sit there at the beach, you say, oh, wow, this is beautiful. I can't believe God made all this stuff. Or maybe for you, it was when you went to um, some mountain campground, right? I'm not a beach person either. So you went to some mountain campground, you say, wow, I'm going to stop. I'm going to worship God in this instant. What I'd like to do today is take that kind of thing and make it a more of an everyday experience for all of us who are hearing this today. Okay, I'm going to share two ways that I think a relationship with God can turn the light bulb on for you to worship God through nature. Here's the first one. Uh, Psalm 19. I love this psalm. Uh, Psalm 19, and here's David in Psalm 19, the first three verses, talking exactly about how God communicates to us uh, through nature. So it starts this way, verses 1 through 3 of Psalm 19. It says, The heavens declare the glory of God. And the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words, whose voice is not heard. Psalm 19 starts out, The heavens declare the glory of God. Now, unless you are Belle from Beauty and the Beast, uh, I'm guessing that most of us here are not going around uh, reading our Bibles as we walk around outside, right? So you're not probably reading your Bible as you're walking around outside. Psalm 19 is fascinating because it goes on to describe how God's word in Scripture is very helpful and, and important in our lives. And I'm not saying that it's not at all. What I am saying and what David's saying here is that every time you're outside, you have the opportunity to, to experience God's glory through what you see around you. We just sang about this just a minute ago. Um, We have the option, you have the option, of pausing long enough to notice what's around us and to experience God's glory. That's that's not a a small deal. Um, here's, Here's another way to think about this. Do you ever wonder why when you walk outside is there something there instead of nothing? Like, we just go through our day, right? Why, when you open the door, do you see trees uh, which have their branches, like, up as if they're glorifying the Lord? Why do you see beautiful, um, the sun or the sky or all sorts of wildlife? Just this past week, we saw uh, deer and um, birds and rabbits and all this stuff right through our backyard window. Why do we see all that stuff instead of see nothing? And then once you get to that question, you don't want to stop there because you actually want to ask a different question, which is a deeper question, which is, well, what kind of God would create all of this stuff? And when you ask that, what you see is that we have a beautifully and intricately fascinating God, a fascinating God. For example, someone sent me an email uh, about two weeks ago. I mentioned cicadas, the 17-year cicadas. You all are familiar with these things? They come out only on prime number years to avoid predators. I don't know if you know anything about this. It's just a like fascinating thing. How did God orchestrate that or why? Or, as I've mentioned other times, uh, morel mushrooms. If, you, if anybody here looks for these morel, tasty morel mushrooms, they primarily grow under dying, slippery elm trees. Like, how does that even work? Like, what on earth? Like, <clears throat> migratory birds, that's like a whole other realm. Like, how do they know where to go, when to go, how far to go, all this kind of stuff? 
Like, you ever think through these kinds of questions? And when you do, what you should see is not, wow, this stuff is amazing. You should say, wow, the creator that made this stuff is really amazing. God has some really big, beautiful things that are worth being in awe of. For example, um, the solar system. Like, you get things light years and how far away stuff is and planets, all that stuff. It's, like, amazingly awesome. And then there's a bunch of small stuff, right? So, like, the human cell or how do ant colonies work, like, tiny little stuff, also amazingly awesome. And we should stand in awe and worship the God who made all that. Here's the second way that Jesus can turn on the lights and help you worship God through nature. Um, It's because in nature we find this thing called grace. Grace. Now, some of y'all might think that grace only shows up in theology books and before we eat uh, the picnic meal today. Um, But theologically, what I want to talk about now is a thing that's called common grace. Common grace. I don't know if you've heard of this before or not. Common grace. And common grace is this. It's, It's the idea that regardless of people's response to God, he is still good to them at some level. Regardless of their response to him, God is still good to people at some level. In other words, what we all deserve because of our sin and rebellion from God is is this. We deserve complete annihilation, right? Like all humans dead this instant and no humanity going forward. That's what we deserve. That's not what we get, folks. What we get is that everybody, even if the, the, the folks that are the most adamantly against God, still have the opportunity during their life to live as, as people for at least that time period. And during that time period, um, we get to experience of God in nature. Here's uh, what Jesus has to say about this idea of common grace. So this is Matthew 5, starting at verse 43. It says this. It says, You have heard that it was said... You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. So in other words, love good people and hate bad people. That's how a lot of us think about life. And Jesus says, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. In other words, wait, 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 don't do that. Love your enemies and pray for those who are actually the the bad ones. So that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. In other words, do that because that's precisely how God is. And then he goes on to give a perfect example of this. He says, uh, For he makes his sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. In other words, what God does is even though we all deserve complete annihilation, he gives us this thing called the sun. And my guess is most of us on a typical Tuesday or Sunday morning or whatever, even this afternoon, you're going to say, wow, that sun's hot, and you're going to be annoyed and, and bothered by it. But just let me tell you, my friends, if that sun wasn't there, you wouldn't be alive. You would not be alive. And God gives that sun to shine, and it provides energy so that we can have food and life for people who love God and people who don't. He's good to all of us. He also sends rain on the just and on the unjust. In other words, we we need water. And some people say, it's a miserable day because it's a rainy day outside. Well, let me tell you that if you're, only, if you're miserable every time it rains and you wish sun, sunny skies all the time, we would not have human life on earth if we didn't have this thing called rain. And God sends his rain on the just, and he also sends it on the unjust. This is the kind of God that we worship. <clears throat> I want to um, share a couple points of application for those two, two ideas today, and then I'm going to close uh, and talk a little bit about Jesus. So when we think about the pie piece of your life and think about how can you take some part of you which is connected at some level with, with God's creation and how, how do we, how do we influ, uh, insert God into that so we can worship God in our experience of nature, here's some ideas of how to go about doing that. Number one is to be a scientist. To be a scientist. Now, in my opinion, there's an unfortunate thing that has happened which is this, because there's been kind of a divide between, um, say, those who, scientists who do not believe in a God, those atheist scientists, and people who believe in religion, believe in Christianity, who say the supernatural is possible. Because of that, Christians in some cases have left 
the world of science. They've left the world of science. In other words, we say, we're Christians, and those are those scientists over there. It's very, very unfortunate. Here's why. Science is precisely nothing more than people investigating God's creation to a point where they can then say, wow, I can't believe God made all this. Wow, I can't believe God made all this. And so we need, as Christians, to be scientists. We need people who are super interested in tiny little bugs or in outer space or in all sorts of stuff to say, wow, look how complex and intricate and wonderful all this stuff is. There's got to be a God behind all that. There's no way there's not. Number two, to stand in awe. I remember uh, I was a weird 20-year-old guy. Um, I'm now a weird 40-year-old guy, but I was a weird 20-year-old guy, and I, I used to go, uh, I would wake up early. I, I had, for some reason, I had in mind that I wanted to see a sunrise from the bridge uh, that goes from Pope Hattie, State, uh, Pope Hattie Park area to where the railroad tunnel is, if you know where I'm talking about, at Penn's Creek. And so I woke up ungodly early time and drove the whole way out there so I could get there in time for the sunrise some, some one day years ago. I remember watching the sunrise, and I was just, it was shocking to me how beautiful that was when I saw that, that sunrise, that particular sunrise. And I'm guessing most of you have some moment in your life or some time or something that you saw or experienced, whether it be a, a critter or a scene or whatever, where you say, wow, like this was unbelievably amazing, right? Pastor Chris and his family just at the Grand Canyon, this is unbelievably amazing. I think it's important that we do that, and here's why. If we put screens in front of our faces and we drive in our cars and we live in our houses and we get disconnected from the natural world, we can start to think, kind of get a little bit big in our britches, right? You you know what I'm saying? Like we think, uh, people are pretty important, you know? We're in control of a lot of stuff. We have a lot of capabilities. Like look look at all the stuff that I can do, that I can influence and all this kind of stuff. But when when we stand in awe of nature, that gives us the opportunity to say, wait a second, just like, if you ever read the, the end of the book of Job, it's kind of like God saying, wait a second, Job, like, I know you're a good guy and all this stuff, but you weren't there when I created this whole world. Like, I'm way, way, way bigger and way more capable than you imagine. And so you can just like humble yourself a little bit because I got this. And if we don't stand in awe of what God's done and what he's created around us, we're going to miss out on the opportunity to actually become humble in the face of that. Number three is to notice God's grace. Notice God's grace. It's easy, I think, to go through life and say, you know, this person, their life is going well, and my life stinks. Their life, look, look, some good thing happened to them. They have a good marriage. They have a good family. Look at me. I'm over here with all my, my mess. And yet, when you see, as Jesus clearly pointed out in Matthew 5, that God sends his son to shine on good and bad people, He gives rain on the just and the unjust. Like God, the fact that we are alive and have the opportunity to experience life in this creation, that's already a grace that we've been given. And so, sure, we go through difficult things. We have hard times in our life. I get all that. But I'm I'm saying that we got to make sure we have the right perspective to say God is a gracious and good God. Number four, we worship the one behind the thing. Worship the one behind the thing. I think there's a lot of folks, and in some cases in my life, I've been this person, where we, I, like, I love nature, I love all this stuff, but it's easy to focus on and say, I just love that thing, I love the experience of being in nature, I love what it does for me. Ultimately, though, that should just open the door to say, look at God, the God who created all of this, right? That we could sing this song, like, then sings my soul, you know? And and, and because we see that what God has created is around us and it's beautiful and it's great and it's worth enjoying, but we do it to say we're going to worship God, not just worship the thing that we experience. Okay, one last thing and I'm out of your way. I'm very interested in this sermon series and how, in particular, how Jesus connects with all this kind of stuff. In other words, how's the relationship between Jesus and creation and our experience of God through creation. And it, there's a passage in Colossians chapter 1 that really helps us to think this through. And it starts out, I think it's verse 15, it says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. 
He's the image of the invisible God. In other words, when you think of creation and think of what God created for us all to experience and his grace through that and all that kind of stuff, when Jesus came into this creation, and this is, this is where it gets fascinating, right? So Jesus was there at creation. He's the image of the invisible God. Then he inhabits into creation. And why does he inhabit into creation? Well, it's ultimately because he wants us to be able to experience the way life ought to be experienced in the best possible way to give glory to him. And so um, it says also in that same passage that he holds all things together, that Jesus holds all things together. And so he was there at creation. He's currently holding all things together. And he lived and died and sacrificed his life for us to provide us salvation. What does that salvation offer for us? I think it, it offers a, a whole lot of stuff. <laughs> one of those things being this. One of those things being this. Jesus has always intended for us to be able to experience the creation as best we possibly could. And we oftentimes fail at that because we don't notice. We walk outside and we don't notice that the sun is good because that's helpful to us. We don't notice that the rain is necessary because that makes things grow. We don't notice these kinds of things. And yet, Jesus' sacrifice is going to allow, and if you follow the, the end of the book uh, of Revelation, that there's going to become a day where there's a new heaven and a new earth. And oftentimes, and I get this, we oftentimes think heaven is this like cloud floating around, kind of this cultural vision of heaven. And yet Revelation talks about the, the joining of the new heaven and the new earth. And that in some way, we're going to inhabit a thing that's been created by God. We're going to inhabit some physical space that is made by God. And he's always wanted that for us. And so ultimately, through Jesus' sacrifice, we, we worship him because whatever you love about nature now, and I know a ton of people in here that love being out in nature and, and it's just so good for their soul and everything. Whatever you're excited about that, <laughs> I'm telling you folks, it's going to be even better. It's going to be even better than that. And that's, that's because of what Christ did for you. Right? And so you don't take Jesus out of this equation, say God made the earth and I like, I like creation, something like that. No, it's going to be even better because of what Jesus did for us. All right, let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help us as, as um, your children uh, who do go astray, who deserve um, complete annihilation who deserve uh, not to experience any taste of the goodness that you give us. I pray, Lord, that you would, uh, by your grace, uh, open our eyes to the goodness that you have already provided for us, the goodness that comes through um, our experience of the natural world, our experience of the land and the water the sun and the rain, the cicadas and the morel mushrooms. I pray that you help us to experience it and to worship you, to be inquisitive and to use that to give glory to you in our experience of nature. I pray even more deeply than that, Lord, that you would help us to see Christ um, as being involved in that creation and as caring so much that we get to experience this uh, experienced life to the fullest, that he entered into this created world and sacrificed himself for our good. I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to look forward to the day where we, uh, what we claim in some of these songs here today becomes fully real, or what we experience this afternoon becomes fully real in our ability to glorify you as, as the one who made the best life possible for us, uh, starting here on earth and into eternity. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.